So it's good to have a spiritual book that tells you how to forgive step by step and it also says, okay, you're going to go through six stages of the development of trust because you need trust to forgive. You need a lot of trust to let go of the hurt. So in the teacher's manual he gives one, two, three, four, five, six stages that you're going to go through. And I looked at the six stages and four out of the six are dark, challenging, difficult. That's two-thirds of the whole journey. Two-thirds? Two-thirds? That means if, I, if the journey was 90 years long, that 60, 60 years would be difficult. And I was like looking at this going, oh, but again, I had said to Jesus, I said, give it to me straight. <laughs> I want it straight. I don't want, don't give me the sugar coating. You know, give it to me, whatever it's going to take. Give it to me straight. And he said, here, this is it's straight. So, is it necessary? No. Uh, <clears throat> is it usually experienced that way? Yes. And the reason is, is holding on. Uh, when the, the ego is desperate to hold on to the past. But what to do? Well, what you do is, is if you have willingness, like I was just sharing, you, you start to get new experiences. That even when all the darkness was coming up for me and the tears were coming every day, like a fountain or like a, a waterfall, I thought, oh, oh, this is great. I turned it on, now I will never uh, be able to turn it off. It felt like that. It felt like, where is the light at the end of the tunnel? You know, this is, I don't see a light. It's just very, very, very dark. But I, then I would say to myself, oh, I'm doing my work, I'm not hiding and protecting the emotions, I'm letting them all come, and that's the most I can do. I, I thought to myself, I'm doing the inner work, it's not easy, but this is what I'm doing, and what else would I rather do with my time? If I'm just going to have to keep replaying these same beliefs over and over and over, until I bring an end to this cycle, then what else do I have to do with my time? You know, it's like, let's get to it. I would even make prayers to the Holy Spirit and Jesus where I would say to them, bring it on. <laughs> Some people always say, don't ever say that to the Holy Spirit. But I, <laughs> I would do that, you know, I would say, bring it on, bring it on. Like, what's, why are we, I'm not going to delay, I'm not going to wait. You know, give it to me. Pat Benatar did a song too, it was, Hit me with your best shot. Fire away, you know, just try that with the Holy Spirit. But what happens is, sure, it, it seemed intense, but I wouldn't have changed it now in the sense that I realized that I had to learn how to trust. It's just like if you've been used to walking with a cane or crutches, you know, and finally one of the crutches gets kicked away, and then the other one gets kicked away, you're going to be able to walk faster when you don't have to rely so much on on the crutches. And crutches, I would say to mean that there, this world is, this, the ego mind is full of defense mechanisms, when the only way that we can start to let go of some of these defense mechanisms is to learn how to trust, to listen, and to follow intuitively the spirit that's guiding us. So, I've written lots of stuff on the internet and shared lots of gatherings about my parables of how I would just go out and travel and learn how to trust that I would be provided for. To learn how to trust, to listen and follow. You know, to learn how to get David out of the way and get to the point where my mind was receiving guidance. And then every, the lessons came very quick after that. We were talking right before when we were having lunch today and, and Anna was saying that she's, she and a friend, Sina, are giving, they're giving her partner a, a present. He, he, her partner lives in the house with six children and they're going to buy him a ticket to Gothenburg, a round trip ticket for a week 
and just drop him off in Gutzeburg with no cell phone, no money, uh, <laughs> nothing. Of course, he's, he's freed up from the house with six kids, uh, but he's, they're just going to drop him as an experiment. This is the first experiment. And they may buy a one-way ticket uh, in the future, or they may send him to another country, uh, <laughs> drop him in Russia or something like this. And she said already, he said, what if I don't want to come back? <laughs> yeah, starting off with the round trip ticket, but he's already you know, putting it forward like, what if I don't want to come back? So, but these kind of experiences build trust. He's, he's worked with the Course in Miracles. He's, he, it'll be an interesting experience. You see somebody, you go to Gothenburg, you see somebody wandering around. <laughs> Maybe you can be part of the plan. <laughs> Jag har en fråga som tillhör den här. Det värsta av, av den här i all denna smärta och svåra skuldfyllda. Det är liksom att jag känner mig oftast helt kärlekslös. Det känns att jag kan varken ta emot eller ge kärlek. Jag känner inte, jag känner inte igen kärleken alls. Jag känner ingenting. Och jag känner mig liksom avskärmad från allt och alla, liksom helt, helt ensam i hela universum. Mm. Just den här kärlekslösheten, det är nog det värsta liksom som mm. kan möta en i, i, i den här smärtan. Mm. Mm. Yeah, she says that the worst, the, the worst in this experience of the doubts and everything is the lack of love, the lack of giving love or be able to receive love or to feel love. Um, yeah, is, is it something more? Oh, just that it seems to be completely and alone. Yeah, and there is an experience of isolation and loneliness and uh, being uh, yeah, uh, shut off from everything. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, for me it was like, I, I felt all those emotions as well, and I felt like, I actually had to come to a point where I go, I, I really had to admit, I really was addicted to fear and guilt, uh, and sadness, I mean, in isolation. Really had to first admit it, you know, like this is a major addiction, just like if you were addicted to heroin, or addicted to uh, alcohol or something, and you had to go through a detox. Let's say you'd been addicted to heroin, and finally they said, here, we're putting you off, you're going to go through a detox, you're going to go through all kinds of side effects and, and tremors and shakes and everything, but, but it's good, you know, you will come out the other side. That, that admission is so important, because it's like, that's the first step in healing, you know, is to say, I'm not feeling these emotions, the love, the support, the nurturing, because of the addiction that I've got going on in my mind, this mental addiction that I've got. It's an ego, it's just ego. It's not uh, anything more than that. It's judgment and ego. But then, when you make the commitment, then things start to shift and change. You get, you get little glimmers of hope that come through when you make that commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, the Spirit immediately responds mm -hmm. to, to that commitment. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, it seemed for me it was slow going at the beginning. You know, it seemed very, very, very slow. <coughs> and, but, again, my willingness and my persistence was, okay, then so be it. If that's the way that it seems at the beginning, if I just have to put one foot in front of the other, and that's all I can do, then that's all I can do. But I'm going to keep, keep at it and keep working at it. And then, the, the Course says the Holy Spirit needs happy learners. When we're holding on to the past, we're clinging to these old thought patterns and beliefs, it goes very slow. But the more trust we develop, the more we loosen up, then everything gets much faster. I spent the first five years of traveling, I didn't have a, a house, a home. I didn't have any place to call home. 
I went out. I didn't know where I'd be sleeping at night. I didn't know oftentimes where my next meal would come from. I went, I really followed, the, as Jesus has said in the Bible, you know, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added unto you. I went out there and I would go to course groups, I would go to different places and would visit. I didn't know sometimes how I'd get gasoline in my car. I just really trusted a lot. But those first five years really showed me how the plan works. Because I had so many angels, so many situations that showed up to help me out. And it was more of a feeling that I had to trust and watch the witnesses and let go of the past cons the past learning of how I would even be provided for. I had to just really let go a lot. And those five years of travel really helped so much uh, because I didn't really have a house to go to. I mean, I, I would watch the sun going down and I would say, huh, where am I going to be sleeping tonight? I would get guided to a Course in Miracles group. I'd be sharing with the Course in Miracles group, still thinking, how's this going to work out tonight? And sometimes I'd get three different people that would come up and offer me a place to sleep. And I'd be like, now what? And the Holy Spirit said, now I will direct you which house to go to. You know, it, was, it wasn't always such a scarce thing. It was more, you know, you still have to follow where in the plan you can be most helpful. And that was very helpful. I never had to be concerned about if I'd have enough to eat, too. They'd have Course in Miracles potlucks. It was more refusing food because so much stuff was coming. You know, it was not the way I thought. At the beginning, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I was thinking the worst case scenario. But it never, it never worked out that way. So, it's, it's by listening and following and having experiences, those new experiences, that that washes away those old thoughts and those old thought patterns. And then we build confidence and trust. And the more that you build the trust, the faster the lessons come. And the more joyful the lessons come. So it's just at the beginning, you just have to really be patient and, per and persevere with those things. Healing your mind is like cleaning a, a, a turkey pan. In other words, it, when you cook a, a turkey, you have to, you know, put the turkey, stuff the turkey, put it in this pan, and you have to bake it for many hours. Mm -hmm. And it really is a mess uh, when you're done. It's got stuff stuck all to the sides and everything. So she said, cleaning your mind, well the first thing you do is like with the turkey pan, you have to fill the pan with water, and then you've got to put all the soap in, and you've got to let it soak. Uh, for a while, because it's like, it's really baked onto the side. And then, you've got to scrub and scrape uh, quite a lot uh, to really clear the, the pan of the things before you can actually dump out all, then the water, she said, gets much dirtier before the pan's going to get clean, the water's going to get dirtier, because of all the crud that's stuck on the sides has to kind of get taken in. And then you have to dump it out, and then you rinse, and then that's the process. So I thought that was a very interesting analogy for cleaning the mind, and clearing the mind, because there seems to be a lot of work involved in it. And yet, you know, when you finally get to the point when it's clean, it seems most natural. It seems like it's the most natural ever when you're just in that flow and you're free of the judgments, but while you're going through the process, it can be quite intense. And I wanted to share too, Jenny wanted to share a little bit about her experience of coming over to our Peace House. Uh, I met Jenny, I was with Anna and a group of friends at Rinkesta, where we had uh, all of the Scandinavian countries who work with the Course in Miracles and all of the translators from all of the countries there. And there was about, what is it, 40? Yeah. About 40 of us. Mm -hmm. And I started off the week, Anna was there, and, and Alex, and uh, Jenny came 
later in the week and had a very powerful experience uh, when she first heard me speak. And I invited a number of people to come uh, to come over to the uh, Peace House. And uh, Anna came and then uh, Jenny came and Jenny just wanted to share a little bit about her experiences of, uh, of the, all the love she felt and then all of the darkness that came up after that. That probably it relates to some of the questions we've been having today. Yeah, I just thought about it when you spoke because uh, that the darkness I really felt it, and uh, I remember I I prayed to God when I was younger that okay uh, do this fast I want to go the fast track, <laughs> and uh, I think that's why I met David. So I was just dropped uh, in the peace house. It it felt like that, the Holy Spirit. Okay, you're gonna be with him. And when I uh, met David, the first, uh, we had, uh, it was like a very powerful experience of love. And uh, then uh, a fear came soon after that, that, uh, okay, can I trust him? Uh, can I really, really trust him? Because I felt, uh, I, I really, really, really need to trust him because I felt like I'm putting my life in, in his hands almost. I'm, I'm going to go into a process here. So... Uh, I had an experience uh, that I really, really could trust him. It was very powerful. Uh, it was about uh, a fear that I couldn't trust. So uh, um, I all that had to change in my mind. So I, I had an experience that I really, really, really could trust David, and and that was the beginning of a, a very powerful uh, light experience. I was felt like I was in light for um, weeks maybe, I don't know, because I, I lost uh, the track of time. I didn't know about time anymore. I was just in this in this light and, and love and I the spirit spoke through me. I felt like I didn't speak, I didn't make any effort for anything. And that experience just uh, went on, but uh, then it was like a crash when, <laughs> when the ego uh, that I, I still had came, came up and uh, like protested and and I went into a guilt that was so uh, deep and so difficult <laughs> that. Um, I started to itch my whole body, so I was bleeding and I was uh, sitting <laughs> in fear in, in a room in the peace house and I was just, uh, I couldn't move because the fear was so, so strong. So, and finally I had, I had to just leave, I couldn't stay there, I had to go to Sweden and, <laughs> and then it was a long period of, of uh, much darkness, really. So, um, I think um, it is like if you ask for the fast track, you <laughs> you really have to meet the darkness. But but it, I I think it's <laughs> it's the best way to go because it's, it is fast <laughs> and uh, yeah and then it started to I have to work through uh, lots of emotions. It still comes up and and uh, but I I know that I have. Uh, um, began to, uh, to change my, my thinking. And I actually had a, a, um, a strong uh, experience of uh, how I prayed for changing my whole uh, thought system to turn it around. And uh, that was the start uh, a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. But uh, it's not really that. You, you don't always know what you pray for. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, with this timelessness, I mean, how, how does it work with um, coming to time for, a, for example, a meeting like this or you know, being in time with lunch before that and you know, planning things? How do you... How do you to get that to go together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's actually a Course in Miracles workbook lesson, um, lesson 135, 
and I, I believe it's the longest lesson in the book where he actually gets into planning and he says it's a healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan but it also talks in there about uh, that you it, planning if there are plans to be made it comes from inner listening so in terms of practicality as you're very intuitive you still will go through plans but they'll be given it won't be something where you have to figure it out and change and change and change and change. It's more like, uh, more like a download. Like, ah, mm -hmm. oh, here's what's to happen. Mm -hmm. That happened to me um, in uh, last November. I was just getting ready to leave to go to uh, South America, and I got an email right when I was going out the door to go to catch the plane to South America, asking me if I would speak at the 2009. Uh, National Course in Miracles conference in San Francisco and so I just asked and, and the Spirit said say yes and just by me typing okay I'll be there then that's set in motion uh, the planning that they have to do for these national conferences they they give themselves two years and I think they're trying to target uh, they have space for 500 and they've got like 475 signed up but but that's an example of practicalities and how it works. And then when you're given a plan from the Spirit, it's your joy to follow through with it. You know, you don't like change your mind and go, well, the Spirit told me to commit to this, but I'm, uh, I think that I got a better offer. <laughs> you know, or something like that. You don't, you don't tell the Holy Spirit, I got a better offer. <laughs> it's one thing to say, hit me with your best shot and bring it on, but you <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> And you don't have to bargain <laughs> and say, well, I'm getting this and this and this, you know. But uh, it works out in practical terms, uh, just in terms of things. I know I was in Spain and I knew I had a little bit of time left and I really wanted to come up here to Stockholm. And we had also a friend in Aarhus, uh, Denmark, that was wanting to try to bring us up. But we just had to kind of wait and wait and see wait for th things to come through and then when it did the plan was made and then it kind of just clicked into the, the schedule so it does there's a an interactive component experientially though you start to get more like with a childlike sense of wonder and glee so that even when plans are made and even if you seem to be in the middle of of an event or a task or a plan or something it doesn't really feel like you're in it. It's more like you're just beholding it, like you're witnessing it and observing it. Just like with a movie, you know, you can get all caught up in the movie or you can be kind of the witness self and, and observe it. So the planning aspect still goes on, but it's more like a, a friend of mine calls it JC Central for Jesus Christ Central, like central casting. Uh, all the, the people that come everything's orchestrated, mm -hmm. lots of synchronicities, those are, are quite common. So you at least you, need, you still need to look at the watch. <laughs> I mean, also you did that when you were in, did you call that time lessons? No, I didn't look you at didn't the watch. No, watch I, I was, when I started to wake, <laughs> wake up or not, because I felt like I was awake mm -hmm. when I started to be more normal. I. I looked at the watch and, and I started to look at the calendar, what date it was, and <laughs> I saw it had gone <coughs> so long time, and I just, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Yeah. But did you miss things then? Or, or no, I had nothing planned. I was in the Peace House and okay. I had no plans for anything. So I didn't the Peace House is kind of like a modern day cave. <laughs> uh, back, I can see why the mystics <laughs> would go to caves and live in the woods. But we often time, you know, lose track of time. But Sorry, what did you say? We often lose track of time, but if there's something, like I know for me, I would have times of prayer and meditation where I would lose track of what day it was, what month, what year, everything like this. And then, but in practical, practical terms, you know, they pick up the garbage. The garbage truck comes by on one day of the week. I think it was Thursday. Thursday or Friday morning, so basically I had to make a sign for myself and put a sign out, garbage out, like the night before. Uh, 
in a practical way just to remind myself to get the garbage out so when the garbage truck came by. But, I mean, if, if, it, if it boils down to that's your biggest concern, is making sure that you get the garbage out <laughs> for the garbage truck, then you really are advancing pretty far. You don't have to be concerned. But the Holy Spirit will guide you step by step. So, for example, if you're working at a job, and you have a career, and so on and so forth, time is still very important in careers, and in jobs, being on time, and so on and so forth. So, you use it as part of your mind training for attentiveness. And then, um, the more you get into the flow of just listening and following, then, then you start to see that everything is perfectly synchronized. Like, uh, I had a job teaching psychology at an art institute, which was my last job in the world. And I remember I would, I would show full-length movies during the four-hour psychology class, and I would actually be guided to pick up the movie in the morning. I would never know what the movie would be until I would get there, and the Holy Spirit would say, this is the movie. I would show it. We'd have a wonderful discussion. And one day I dropped the movie off uh, as I was leaving, uh, and I had to catch the bus. And I was just kind of like watching, watching, watching my body go across, take the movie over to the library, you know, take it back, turn it in, walk around, and I'm coming up, like, like here in Stockholm, in Cincinnati, walking along a city block, just so happy and joyful, knowing that I'm supposed to catch the bus. I came up to the crosswalk, I could see the bus coming <laughs> up the street, just waited, waited till I got the green light, walked across, took two steps, psst, the door opened, I said, oh, this is cool. You know, just, I mean, I just, it was almost like, some of you might have seen the Volkswagen commercial, where they, they did a Volkswagen commercial where they got this great song on the radio, and the beat's going, and the, and the windshield wipers are, are perfectly in sync with the song. But then you look out, and you can see the people moving, and all the people on the street are all moving, and it's all synchronized to this song that's playing. And it was a Volkswagen ad, <laughs> the Witcher Wipers and the people. Your life starts to get more like that, where you start to feel like, wow, it's all perfectly orchestrated, like a big dance. When you're not judging it, when you don't have this ego chatter going on saying, oh, I've got to do this, I'm, oh, I can't forget this, I must be sure I do this and that. It's the ego's desire to control time that makes it so stressful. And yet, Jesus tells us that, he says, if you will be a miracle worker, he says, I will arrange time and space for you. Nobody ever taught us that when we were growing up. That there was a being that loved us so much, that, that this being would arrange time and space for us uh, as we're doing miracles. It seems to human beings like we're just stuck in time and space. You know, that's part of the human condition. We're stuck. You know, we're stuck in between these days and months and years, and there's nothing we can do. We just have to live out our time and then die and see what comes. And he's saying no. So, as a miracle worker, I mean, I, that's just a term Jesus uses, miracle worker, teacher of God. I've had experiences where I was supposed to go down to South America to do a talk because these people down in Colombia in Cali, Colombia, invited me to go down and talk to them down there. But I, my mother was a history teacher, but I, I really am not so much into geography. All I know is that if there's an invitation and everything clicks, I'll just go and answer the call. But I didn't know if Cali, Colombia was a little tribe of 12 people, or whether it was a city or a village or whatever. It turned out to be a city of like two, two between two and three million people. And they said, oh, we've been translating your writings from the web into Spanish, and we must bring you here. We're going to, we don't have the money, but we're going to get the money, and we're going to get you a plane ticket, and then we want you to come. And I said, okay. So I waited. I was doing travels through the United States. It turns out these people, this is down in these poor countries, so to speak, they had to borrow the money to get my plane ticket. Now that's faith, when 60% of your country lives on two dollars a day. Uh, that's the average amount that 60% of the country 
lives on. And now they're getting money for a plane ticket. They're borrowing the money. I later heard the story that they, they had the money, but they were too afraid of their postal system, because people steal things uh, in the mail down there. So they found a man who was going to the United States, to Miami, Florida, and they trusted him to take the money, get it to Miami, and then mail it to me, uh, so I could buy the ticket. And he got it to Miami, but then he kept it <laughs> for himself for a while. But then after a couple of weeks, he decided to mail it. They're all waiting in Columbia. Did you get the money? Did you get the money? So he finally we got the money. They bought the plane ticket. You know, we, we bought the plane ticket with the money. I still didn't know what Cali Columbia was, or I didn't know they had a 40-year civil war going on. Some of you have just seen on the news the past couple of days the guerrillas. You know, they, they kidnap people, take them up to the, the mountains. Where I knew nothing about any of this. All I know is the ticket got bought, and then I had to call for a translator that I had met in the Canary Islands off the coast of uh, Africa, south of Spain, to come and translate for me, and she said yes. So she was married and had children, but she got the strong call to come and translate for me. She flew all the way to Madrid and then all the way across to Miami, Florida. I met, I came down to Miami, Florida with this money that I had, this ticket from the Colombians. And this is the time when all the hurricanes were hitting uh, the Florida coast, like four hurricanes. And one was coming for the southern part of Florida. So it was like an evacuation clinic. It was like everybody, mothers with babies crying. People, all these people, Hispanic people in Florida are trying to get out of Florida because it's been hit with three hurricanes already. And I'm looking around trying to find my translator so we can hop on the plane and go down to uh, Columbia. And finally I find her. We get on the plane. As soon as the plane takes off, we just get up into the air. They said they've shut down the entire Miami airport, international airport, right after, coincidentally, uh, after our plane took off. So I used the story with the Colombians. I said, Jesus was like holding off the hurricane. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Okay. <laughs> and they shut the airport down. But actually, Think about it. Jesus says, I will arrange time and space for you. It's kind of nice to think you'll, you'll hold off a hurricane <laughs> for me? <laughs> you know, am I that important? Well, he's saying, yes, if you give your mind to perform miracles or let him perform miracles through you, all of time and space will be arranged. In fact, there's a, you know, some of you remember from the Bibles, there was the lilies of the field passages about, you know, Look at the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor toil, and you know, they're cared for, they're attired greater than Solomon. There's a, there's a paragraph in A Course in Miracles which has come to be known as the promise, where Jesus says, once you have accepted His plan, meaning the Holy Spirit's plan, as the one function that you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you without your effort. Without my effort. He will go before you, making straight your path, and leaving in your way no stones to trip on and no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. Before I reach it. He says, you need take thought for nothing except the only purpose you would fulfill. Now that's quite a promise. <clears throat> Think of wherever you are in your life that the Holy Spirit and Jesus are saying, if you will just let me shine the light through you, if you will just let miracles come through your mind, through your consciousness, you know, I'll take care of everything else. And that includes a job, if you need a job to pay off debts, if you need a job to undo certain aspects of the ego that are important for forgiveness opportunities, it will be given. He even says the Holy Spirit will take nothing from you as long as you have need of it. You know, and He will supply you with whatever you need as long as you have need of it. So that's an amazing promise. And I think in my life I just finally said, okay, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Uh, 
you know, really give the devotion over and say, you guide me, I trust you, and then it has felt more like a fairy tale uh, than, a, than an actual lifetime because of all the synchronicities and the things that fall in. I mean, I, I have not been guided to copyright anything, so, and I've not been guided to sell anything. It's all just done on a donation basis. And even organizers that set up things, you know, I just accept the donations and use them to travel or to make supplies or whatever to help disseminate the supplies and then keep doing it. And it's been going on like that for like 17 years now. And so it's not been the standard route of like writing a book or, or trying to use the channels of the world to kind of get some fame or some recognition and then piggybacking on that recognition to travel. I've been going around the United States and Canada since 1991 and, and around the world since 2003. And if somebody had said to me, you know, what do you think about world travel? I, said, I would have said, I, I don't even know about it. I don't have a passport. And I, don't, I would not understand how you could do world travels without some kind of major support. Uh, it's for somebody who's got you know, no church affiliation, no affiliation with any kind of institution or whatever, that would be kind of surprising uh, to do it that way. But, but it has just worked out in terms of serving the plan. Uh, it just seems like whatever is needed is provided from frequent flyer miles to a place to stay here or there or whatever. It just seems like it always just clicks into place over and over and over. It's been happening for 17 years, so I've got no reason to question it, you know, it's like if it keeps working over and over, day in, day out for 17 years, then... But what I see is that it's like a whole new world opened up, you know, like I was raised with the Protestant work ethic. I was raised how to earn money, save money, spend money, you know, all the typical things that we go through to be a mature, functioning, adult citizen in this world how to use a credit card, and how to, you know, use a debit card, and so forth, and transfer money, and so forth. And then, what Jesus is saying is like, yeah, it's good, you can do that, that's all good. You can do that without assistance, he says. You can learn all that without assistance. To learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit, and follow the Holy Spirit, you need assistance. <laughs> you need a lot of assistance. Almost like all the learning that you've done to be a mature, functioning adult citizen, it still hasn't freed you. Yeah. Now you're somewhat of a competent human adult citizen, but still you've got guilt and fear, and you're far from free. You're not home free at all. You've just kind of taken a baby step, and now you've got to le learn how to let the Holy Spirit teach you how to listen and follow. And at one point, I don't know if you remember back in the Bible where Jesus said, except you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. He actually tells you exactly what he meant in the first statement, when he tells in the Course, he says, infants, babies, are, are completely dependent on their parents mm -hmm. for their life, for their survival. He meant by that statement, except you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. You have to become as completely dependent on the Holy Spirit for everything, as a little infant is on their parents, to, to make it, in other words, to enter the kingdom of heaven. So, he says at one point, your problem isn't that you ask for too much, it's that you ask for far too little. You know, the Holy Spirit wants to give you everything, and you've got such limiting beliefs, beliefs of unworthiness, that you think, oh, who, who is God to talk to me? Who is God to arrange time and space for me? You know, who is the Spirit, you know, to take care of me? We're so used to thinking of ourselves as kind of small and, and little and insignificant. When he's saying, no, you need to really learn how to be dependent and trust in God for everything. And then he goes on to say, your problem is you still believe you can run some aspects of your life all by yourself uh, and leave some aspects to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and it's like healing is not a partial kind of thing. You don't give the Holy Spirit partial access to your beliefs and to your mind and expect to be healed. 
healing is not partial. Just like nobody's ever been partially pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. Nobody's been partially healed. So you get brownie points or bonus points for being 95% healed or, well, I'm close, 99% healed. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So you start to realize that in the end, you, you realize that as you go through the day, you let the Holy Spirit dress you and you let the Holy Spirit guide you in, in small details as well as bigger things. You know, we're accustomed to thinking of big decisions and small decisions, you know. A marriage partner, that seems like a big decision. You really don't want to mess up uh, with that one. <laughs> or you're in for a, a, a real tough ride. But we think of, you know, whether to wear, do I wear socks or, or not with my sandals, you know. That's a, a relatively small decision compared to a marriage partner decision. But Jesus is saying, no, there aren't really big decisions and small decisions. You're making decisions continuously. And there's some decisions that you're making that you're not even consciously aware that you're making them. They're unconscious decisions that are based on your beliefs. And you need to raise those beliefs up into awareness, otherwise you'll be like a robot and just be making decisions based on these past beliefs. So, it really opens things up where you start to see, I need to learn about beliefs and decision making. Uh, sometimes I draw at one point, I, I was into graphics and, and maps and everything, so I asked the Holy Spirit to draw me a map of the mind. And, and, and give me a map, and I have it online. I, I do have uh, some markers over there, I could draw it out, but, but basically he showed me uh, rings. It was almost like uh, concentric circles and rings in which the very core is prayer or desire, and then you have the realm of belief, and then thoughts or cognition, and then emotions, and then way on the outside is perception. Mm -hmm. So the world that we perceive is, is coming about because of all these inner rings, all these inner processes that are going on in our mind. And we just see the gross effect. Uh, the world that we see on, through the five senses, <clears throat> or on the news or whatever, is a projection of what's going on in our consciousness. And, and the deeper you go in, every ring that's inside another ring is causative. So your power of prayer, your power of desire is like the core, your altar, and whatever you wish for from that altar, you perceive in the world. It just goes through a series of, of beliefs and thoughts and emotions and finally perceptions. So, to give you an example, I, I put everything I can, I mean, my whole life has put as much stuff as I can on the internet for free, so people can download it all over the world, translate it into whatever language is helpful, and then let's get this ego thing over with in a hurry, you know, the sooner the better, uh, let's not delay. So I put it all on the web, and, and we were just down in Australia, and a man welcomed Jenny and I and said, I want to fly you up to this kind of uh, resort town. Mm, tropical um, resort place. Tropical resort place up in northern Australia, Palm Cove. And so, we, he said, I, please come. He said, I, I'm a captain in the Qantas Airlines, and so it's no problem for me to get uh, airline tickets and come for a, a day, a week, stay as long as you want. So we went up there. And he said, either I'll be there to pick you up at the airport, or I'll have a limousine uh, waiting for you. I looked at Jenny and I said, I've never been in a limo. <laughs> I didn't know what that would be like. Sounds like another fairy tale story going here, you know, P Palm Cove and resort. So we get there, <clears throat> he's there, no limo, he's there. <laughs> big man with this big bear hug, give us this big hug, and he said, he said, David, I just have one question. He said, if I want to take six weeks out of my life and come and be your shadow and fly to wherever you are on earth, and I just want to shadow you around for six weeks, could I do that? And I said, sure. That's fine with me. You're an airline captain. You can arrange that pretty easily. He said, oh, that's so fantastic. 
So then he takes us out to dinner. He gives us this beautiful place that his wife has decorated for us to stay in. Then he said, <coughs> David, I've been listening to your uh, MP3s on the, on the internet. I said, oh. And he said, you know how many hours you have on there? I said, no, I don't. I just keep uploading. I don't know. He said, you have 400 hours of, of teachings on the internet that you put up there. I said, oh. He said, I know because I've listened to them twice. <laughs> and he says he's originally from Hungary and he, he kind of, he and his mother got out and he told me his whole life story. But he, he listens to hours of A Course in Miracles on audio every day, and then he listens to hours of, of my teachings, trying to simplify the teachings of the Course every day. Now he's got his wife listening to him, making CDs for her. And he says, people, some people say I'm obsessed with this, but he said, this is important. He said, I want to wake up. <laughs> and so he said, I'm coming to your retreat, because we were doing a week-long retreat. I'm coming to your retreat. And he had to try to find a way to get off of work for a week, not for his daughter's wedding or something, but to say he's going to listen to some <laughs> spiritual teacher. He couldn't even explain to Qantas what it was about. So we get to the retreat, after we had these couple days of, of, of this resort house, and he tells me in a one-on-one -on -one session, he said, I've been practicing with the power of my mind with these teachings. I said, well, can you give me an example? He said, well, for example, he said, I was uh, 58 years old, and I suddenly discovered I love to fly, but the regulations for pilots, age limit for pilots, is 60 all around the world. And so he said, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to have to retire in two years. And he said, I really don't want to do this. So. <coughs> what he did was, he said he wrote a choose file, and he wrote it very specifically, I, Les Bliam, his name, want that, asked that by the time it's two months before my 60th birthday, that the rules and regulations for pilots all over the world will change and they will raise the age limit from 60 to 65. Wow. That's an example of using the power of your mind. <laughs> he writes it out as a choose file. And I said, what did you do? He said, I took it in deep into my mind, my consciousness, to the dreamer of the dream. <laughs> to use Course in Miracles term. And he said, I said, what happened to the dreamer? He said, dreamer went, yes. <laughs> Gave the nod. So, he said, a couple of months after the choose file, he noticed on television that all these international Feder uh, aviation boards that have to meet, started to meet to consider raising the age limit. Now he's already written it out that by two months before his 60th birthday, he said, I don't want to have to cut it close. Like, two months before my 60th birthday, it's got to change. So he watches, they meet, they meet, the year goes by, and then it gets to his, his 59th birthday, and the year's going by. His wife, he gave this choose file to his wife too, and showed her. So she could see the whole thing. She said, very interesting. So, <laughs> as it got closer and closer on it, during his 59th year, all of the nations of the world agreed to raise the age limit to 65, except the United States that blocked the whole thing, you know, and said, no, we will not give in. So he watched and watched and watched, and then, two months before his 60th birthday, he looked, and his wife said, Unless you got to get in and see this news report, there was, it was announced on the news that two months before his 60th birthday, they raised the age limit for all the pilots in the whole world. I said, yeah, very good. It's, it's all your world, so <laughs> you did, did a fine job of that one. So then he, he was having more issues, though, with, with uh, he wants to fly the big jumbo jets, you know, the big giant jets. But you have to be at the top of the seniority list to do that. And he had supported a strike of younger pilots that went on strike. And because he came back late, then they demoted him in terms of seniority from like three or four at the top of the system to 900 and something. So he's like, I want to fly the jet, but my seniority is way down. 
So he wrote a choose file. <coughs> he took it to the dreamer of the dream. And the dreamer was like, no. <laughs> so he was like, that was his question. He was like, I want a one-on-one. -on -one. Why? <laughs> Why can't I fly the jumbo jets? And I said, well, you know, there are, there are more important things than these, these little specific pilot whims. <laughs> There's a higher plan here. I said, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. So he, he met with me during the week, and then he, he actually did a one-on-one, -on -one, and then he had a meeting with a man who was a pilot, and who was the top seniority who flew the jumbo jets. And he was very, he had like a tick, and facial movements, and he seemed very nervous and anxious, and the, this man said, oh, my wife and I, we can't even sleep in, in the same room anymore, and all this and that. And it was like the Holy Spirit was saying, okay, you want to fly the jumbo jets? <laughs> this is what your life will look like. <laughs> you know, is this what you really want? He's like, no! <laughs> no, I don't. So, so basically, he ended up re redoing his choose files. He's, he's got a holy relationship partner. He wants to just be a demonstration of holy relationship in this world. And he said he, he wanted to change his choose file. He said, I want to just be as, as happy and joyful as David is consistently before I die. <laughs> so he, he, but that's an example about how powerful the mind is. But then once you start to see that you're doing all of it, then the next point comes to, to peace of mind. You know, to forgiving or waking up from the dream. So using the power of your mind for the for the grand prize, so to speak, you know, going for, you know, eternity instead of uh, being caught in the things of time. But those are great experiences that you have along the way because you start those. It's kind of like the movie The Secret. Some of you might have seen. It just shows you the power of the mind, and it's just a step along the way. You don't want to get caught into manifesting. You know, as, as a way of life, you want to start to see that that's just showing you how powerful your mind is, and then you want to use it for, for forgiveness and for waking up. So does that mean that you, are, are you ever um, praying for a specific thing, or are you always leaving it to, to the Holy Spirit to decide for you what's best for you? Or yeah, how I don't, are you doing? I don't pray for specifics no. anymore. In fact, I, I was reading the the Song of Prayer, and which is another little pamphlet that Jesus dictated to Helen Schuckman. And in the Song of Prayer, Jesus talked about praying for specifics. And he said, whenever you pray for specifics, you're asking for the past to be repeated in some specific way that you believe is best. But you don't know your own best interest. And so, it's actually, he describes prayer as like a ladder where at the beginning you can't help but pray for specifics, because that's all you can relate to. But the higher you go up, you might pay for, pray for certain states of mind. Uh, and as you go higher and higher, he describes the top of the ladder is basically, Father, what is your will for me? Uh, which is perfect happiness. It's not a prayer for specifics in any way. Yeah. So it's step by step. <coughs> yep. Uh, en fråga som säkert alla har funderat på någon gång, liksom, hur skiljer man, hur, hur skiljer man rösten mellan egot som min? Jag vet att den inte är verklig, men den är väldigt högljus och smart och smala upp de vackraste bilderna man kan tänka sig ibland. Hur skiljer man? Jag menar, hur gör man det praktiskt? Jag menar, jag vet inte vad som är ett ekos och vad som är den heliga anden som talar. Mm. How to um, see the difference between the ego's voice and the Holy Spirit? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it definitely takes a lot of practice. But what I've done is, I, through a lot of the gatherings and the teachings, is I I talk about cause and effect because the more you get into understanding cause and effect in a metaphysical way, it gets clearer. The Holy Spirit is always teaching that the mind is causative and that the ego is always trying to trick the mind into believing that the world is causative. So you can tell the difference between 
They're two, they're teaching very different things. In simple terms, whenever you feel a command or a demand, whenever you feel forced or coerced or pushed or pressured, that's the ego. Because the Holy Spirit is very, very gentle. You may get some instructions, but basically the Holy Spirit is like offering you an, up some advice. As an advisor, respecting your mind, respecting your power of choice, and just saying, here, this would be very helpful. <laughs> and you can totally reject it, or you can, can open up to it. Men om jag liksom ber den heliga handen liksom att tala till mig, jag försöker ha tillit, jag liksom sker din vilja så här liksom till det oändliga. Och ändå mår jag bara jättesvart liksom. Ja men är det bara ego som styr hela mitt liv då? Jag menar jag vill ju verkligen, jag försöker ju verkligen liksom ge mitt liv till med heliga anden, Gud, jag menar, så. Mm. En kommentar från mig var, du kanske ber till någonting utanför dig själv. Du ser det som separerat. Mm. Nej, jag inser liksom att det inte är separat, separerat från mig. Jag, jag, mm. Det är en bit där jag har problem med. Mm. Men att det, det fortsätter liksom vara bara svart och smärtsamt. Mm. Det är saying that she's Uh, praying so much uh, to the Holy Spirit and praying and praying and and anyway it's uh, the pain is still there it doesn't change really. yeah well the prayer you might say God always knows the prayer of the heart before a word is spoken so so prayer is a synonym for desire. So, since your mind is the mind of the whole cosmos, not a private little mind, but the whole mind, whatever you desire in your mind, you desire for the whole cosmos. So, if you want, if you desire a piece of, we'll say a piece of cherry pie uh, for dessert, The whole cosmos desires a piece of cherry pie. Because your mind is the mind of the whole cosmos. So, so you can see the desire when, when you say, I pray and pray and pray to God, but I still feel hurt, or I still feel pain, or isolation, or depression. It seems like I'm praying and God doesn't hear, doesn't hear or doesn't answer my prayer. Men jag förstår ju skillnaden liksom att jag, jag ber inte till någonting utanför mig själv. Jag ber inte till en Gud som finns som ett väsen utanför mig själv. Jag förstår ju den skillnaden. Men att det, det, det här är väldigt svårt att förklara. Förstår ni andra? Ja. I have a when you said you put David away and tried to be like that I have an experience with my wife she says I don't want you to put Hans away she wants to keep Hans there so my experience is when you try to when you do like you do you really make a big difference big change then it's e rather easy to understand the difference. But if you try to do it step by step, together with a lot of people, together with people who want to keep you there, to me it's been like, um, not everyday voice, some, I can hear it once and once and once, mm -hmm. and it's away from, first it was 10% or something, and away 90%. Mm -hmm. Now it's more like 40% is there, 60% is away. And I try to go step by step by step. And I, I feel that I get more confident day by day. It shows me, uh, for the three last days, it just shows me everything. 
but I don't trust it. <laughs> uh, no, I, I trust it, but I can't, I can't change it that rapidly. Then I will lose contact with a lot of people. I don't, and I don't want to lose that contact. I want to keep that contact. Mm -hmm. And the result is that my wife, she comes along. <laughs> She, she, she has another pace than I have, but she comes along and we, we go walk together. <laughs> it's very nice, but it's, uh, I think uh, that's important when you listen like this, that you, have to, you can go with the quick way, or you can take the step by step by step way. I want the quick way, fast way. <laughs> and I, I, think, I think that also is a very important uh, decision. Yeah. Mm. If you want to go the quick way, or you go want yeah. to go the step by step yeah. way. Yeah, it's like and the if curriculum is set, but it's like you have a hand on a dial. You can mm. go fast or slow, mm. but the curriculum is set for everyone. Everyone is going to wake up. Mm. It's just that you know you can only the time you take it is voluntary, mm. and it is voluntary. You can't you know mess with that. Jesus, God, Spirit, mm. don't try to mm. intercede with your decision. Mm. You know, it's just. Mm offering lots of support and encouragement, mm -hmm. but you have to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, you can ask the Holy, Holy Spirit which way you shall take. Leave over. I have been trying to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, left yes. door, left door, left door, mm -hmm. left door. Mm -hmm. Take all the pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he brought up a good point too in terms of compromise. That Compromise is the problem. The first substitution ever, in, in, which is just a seeming substitution, was of illusions for truth, putting illusions in place of truth. Mm -hmm. And then a whole cosmos of compromises set up. So there's millions and millions of compromises that you can take or that you can reject and, and go back towards the straight and narrow way that Jesus talked about. But that that's something that that it comes down to willingness. If you really are willing, then things start to happen. You meet people, tools come your way, 